We've been studying the book of Romans and we're in the 8th chapter and we're just going to kind of uh, do a little survey of some stuff between the lines. For in the 8th chapter in verses 17 and 18, we are introduced to a subject that is going to uh, occupy our attention in the next section. But before we get into the next section, we need to stop for a few moments and uh, do a little homework because for most of us, there has been very little teaching on this whole issue. I'm reading from Romans 8, verse 17, and I just want to read these verses, and we'll look at them later, but notice it says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. We're all excited about the first part of that. And then it says, If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider, said Paul, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed in us. J.I. Packer, the great theologian, defines suffering like this. He said, suffering is getting what you do not want while wanting what you do not get. <laughs> there are many terms used in the scripture to deal with this issue, and it's far more extensive than we would ever believe because nobody ever sets out to study this. But when you become sensitized to it, you start running into words everywhere in the New Testament. Words like affliction and anguish and distress and misery and grief and pain and tribulation and chastisement. And metaphors in the New Testament like uh, the refining fire of Isaiah in the Old Testament and overflowing waters and birth pangs. All of these are used as pictures of suffering. I do not know what the health and wealth gospel people do with all these terms because in their terminology there's no place for any of this. But Paul says that before we can reign with Christ and before we're going to be glorified, we're going to identify ourselves with him also in his suffering. And when I talk about suffering, I'm not talking about suffering we deserve. Peter says if you suffer for doing wrong, you got what you deserved. Don't take any glory in that. I'm not talking about people who get in trouble because they violate God's laws or they step outside of the moral boundaries which are so clearly set in the, in the Bible. I'm talking about the kind of suffering that comes on people who are living for God, who are walking in fellowship with Him, who more than anything else want to glorify God with their lives. How do you explain that? C.S. Lewis, who has written one of the most definitive books on pain, said in his book, now God, who has made us, knows what we are and that our happiness lies in Him. Yet we will not seek it in Him as long as He leaves us any other resort where we can even plausibly look for it. While what we call our own life remains agreeable, we will not surrender it to Him. So what can God do in our own best interest but make our own life less agreeable to us and take away the plausible sources of false happiness. Interesting thought. Did you hear what he said? Sometimes God helps us to understand at a very deep level that where we thought our happiness and joy was, was only a mirage, that our happiness really lies in him. So we're going to take a few moments and talk about this whole issue of suffering. And let's talk first about the relationship of suffering to the Christian life. In Romans 8 that we read a few moments ago, we are reminded that suffering and glory go together. Suffering and glory belong together. They are married together. They were married in the experience of Christ. They are married in the experience of his own people. It is only after we have suffered for a little while that we will enter into God's eternal glory in Christ. So the sufferings and the glory are married, and we can't do anything about that. We all want the glory. We don't want the suffering. We want the joy. We just don't want the tribulation. We want Easter Sunday without Good Friday. That's how we're put together. But these two things are welded. They cannot be broken apart. Whatever else you're going to learn, please learn this from the Word of God. You will get glory, you will get joy, you will get fulfillment, and somehow, and this is not a masochistic thing of some fundamentalist preacher, it's just the truth of the Word of God. The pathway to glory takes you through some suffering. 
Now, let's talk for a moment about the reality of all of this, the reality of suffering in the Christian life. There is suffering that is the direct result of our sinning, and we're not talking about that. There is suffering that we endure for Christ's sake. Suffering that comes from our Christian profession in a world that doesn't have anything to do with Christ. There is suffering that comes because we are in this imperfect world. There is suffering that is ours because we are identified with Christ. And the Bible never tries to dodge that issue. I was shocked at how many times this subject appears. And the reason we don't know it is because we read past it. We don't want to stop and camp our, our tent there at all. I and mean, it's not a comfortable subject. We would rather just act as if it's not here. But watch these verses. Notice what it says in 1 Peter 5.10. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. 2 Timothy 3.12. Yea, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, what's the rest of it? Will suffer persecution. Philippians 3.10, Paul writes that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. 2 Corinthians 1.5, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. 1 Peter 4.12 and 13, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also uh, be glad with exceeding joy. Philippians 1.29 For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, what's the rest of it, but also to suffer for his sake. In John 15, 18 to 20, Jesus is speaking. Listen to his words. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Now, is that supposed to comfort us? It, it's the truth, isn't it? If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you too. John 15, 18 through 20. You know, one of the things that happens is a lot of Christians come into faith in Christ and they get excited about the Lord. They have a conversion experience and then they get thrown out into the world and nobody ever tells them this. And all of a sudden they, they show up in a hostile environment. They're excited about their faith. They're excited about Christ. And they find out that everybody's not excited about that. And nobody has helped them to understand. And then they begin to wonder if something's wrong with them. Or something's wrong with their faith. Or why didn't God come through for me when I was under all this pressure? Listen, what the Word of God teaches is this. That suffering is the normal, natural, expected experience of believers. And we shouldn't be shocked when it happens to us in some fashion. John Piper said, So we must not water down the call to suffer. We must not domesticate all the New Testament teaching on affliction and persecution just because our lives are so smooth. <laughs> it may be that we have not chosen to live in all of the radical ways that God wants us to live. It may be that our time of suffering is just around the corner. <laughs> but it will not do to take our own comfortable lives and make them the measure of what we allow the Bible to mean. In other words, we live, many of us, in very comfortable surroundings and in nice homes and we drive decent cars and wear halfway decent clothes and we have most of our needs met. And so it's very difficult for us to come to grips with a subject like this. You suffering? What are you talking about, Pastor? David Barrett, who has done some research on us, estimates that in 1993 there were 150,000 Christians who died as martyrs. 93. He foresees that by the year 2000, there will be 200,000 martyrs in the world who died for Christ. Most of them not in this country, but all over the world where people have borne witness for Christ. They have given their lives for their faith. Suffering is often the lot of God's people. It's just reality. I love what Peter said, don't think it's strange when it happens to you. Don't say, why me? Why now? Whoops, what happened? Just understand. And this is not a defeatist attitude. It's a realistic approach to life that there are bumps on the road. Can I get a witness? Amen. You know that. The reality of suffering. Now, here's the real crux of the issue. What are the reasons for suffering? Why in the world does God allow this? 
Why does he let us suffer? I mean, if he's a good God, I, I remember when uh, Rabbi Kushner wrote his book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. Remember that? It hit the bestseller. It was on New York Times bestsellers list for weeks and weeks. And I, I always have admired him as a communicator. I don't, I don't, I'm not into his theology because he's got, he's got a theology without a Messiah, which I mean, how do you have a theology without a Messiah? And he came to the conclusion that the reason bad things happen to good people is that God is an absentee God in their lives. That he creates the world and he creates people and then he just sort of walks away from it and lets these things happen. Because he said, if God is love and God is in control, then those two things are in conflict. And the only way he could measure that out in his rational thinking was to, to assume that God created us in love but withdrew to let us live our lives and God is not involved in our pain. But God is involved in our pain. Remember, Paul talked about the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. So why do Christians suffer? First of all, suffering proves the reality of our faith. Did you know that? 1 Peter 1.7 says it this way, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, might be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter said, suffering proves the reality of your faith. Hebrews 12.5 says, Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For, watch this, whom the Lord loves... He chastens and scourges every son, every son whom he receives. If you're a son of God, one of the evidences of that, a daughter of God, if I can be politically correct, then you have to understand something, that part of your heritage in the family is you, you're going to experience some suffering. Jonathan Cho, who is the president of Christ College in Taipei, director for the Chinese Church Research Center in Hong Kong has studied suffering in the context of the suffering church in China and he says quote one can almost say that suffering for Christ in our country is a mark of discipleship end of quote and Martin Lord Jones said if you are suffering as a Christian and because you are a Christian it is one of the surest proofs you can ever have of the fact that you are a child of God if you're going through something right now and you can't figure it out and as far as you know there's no sin in your life and God has just put you in the crucible and you're, you're under pressure and you're experiencing some things, you say, what's the good of this? Well, if the Bible says that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer, then one of the, one of the reasons God allows this is, is that it might be a proof to us of our sonship. That's the first reason. Secondly, suffering promotes our dependence upon God. Boy, do we know that. We are so independent. Listen to this verse of scripture from 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. Listen to these words. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, or of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Now watch the rest of this. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. How many of you know it's harder to trust in God when everything's going great? When, you know, you just got to raise... You got everything in order. I mean, you got your whole life planned out. The retirement program's looking pretty good. The kids are all kind of, you know, they're okay, you know. Trust in God. But then you go to the doctor and you hear some bad news or something happens in your home that you haven't expected, and all of a sudden, in the midst of suffering, what do you do? Wow, does it change? You understand how desperately you need God, and you are, you are forced into dependence upon him. Second Corinthians 12, 9 says it this way, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength, now watch this, is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. God often takes his children and puts them through the ringer so that they are divested of their own power and then are filled with his power and Paul said if that's what I have to have to have the power of God in my life then so be it I'd rather have the strength of Christ and the weakness of the flesh than have it other way around God knocked the props out from under Paul 
so that he would have no choice but to fall on God and get his hope only from him. When we go through suffering, it is in order to promote our dependence upon God. Let me give you the third reason. Suffering purifies our relationship with God. I remember these verses, underlining them in my Bible uh, during these last couple of years from Psalm 119, verses 67 and 71. Watch this. This is the psalmist. He said, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. In other words, what the psalmist is saying is that, God, you put me through some trouble, and the trouble made me come closer to you. You know what happens when you're a Christian and you, and you face pressure? The pressure does what? It drives you back to God. The pressure is out here, and it drives you back to God. It draws you closer to Him. It makes your relationship with God to be a very special relationship. I remember reading uh, a story about a, a French painter by the name of Pierre Renard. He was afflicted with arthritis. His hands became twisted and deformed. So much so that a simple task such as holding a brush became excruciatingly painful. In time he was confined to a wheelchair, but he would not give up painting. He refused to do that. One day his friend, Henry Matisse, visited him and watched him as he painfully grasped a brush with only his fingertips. Every movement caused him pain, yet he doggedly kept at this painting. Matisse asked Renaud, and he said, what do you do this for? How can you paint at the expense of such torture? And he replied, the pain passes, but the beauty remains. That's what happens to a Christian who goes through suffering. The pain passes, but the beauty of a greater, deeper, more loving relationship with God, drawing closer to Him, that is a lasting value. One of our hymns puts it this way, When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all-sufficient will be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. What is the hymn writer saying? You're going to go through this. It's going to be painful, but the thing that will happen is God will use it to burn away the impurities of your life and drive you back to Him. James 1.3 says, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. I remember uh, clipping this out of a discipleship magazine, which I get and have taken for a number of years. And it was kind of an analysis of why this is such a hard subject for us here in America. It goes like this, Patience is the supreme taunt to the West. <laughs> It taunts us because we have grown up with the habit of immediacy. We have watched the deepest of human conflicts resolved in 30 minutes on a television screen, and we have come to expect the modern medicine a quick cure for every attack of disease. To the West, endurance is synonymous with frustration. Small endurances bring on a stamping of the foot and a rearing of impatience. We honk the horn if the car ahead of us doesn't pull away from the light when it turns green. We mutter when waitresses take too long. Is it any wonder that we are undone and shattered when we are held in the vice of a prolonged difficult experience? We flail about helplessly. Thoughts of coping are overwhelming and bewildering. We don't want stamina. We want out. Isn't that true of us? So one of the other reasons for suffering is that when we suffer, it produces endurance in us. It makes us hang in there when we don't want to. God takes our impatience in His hands and, and He helps us to learn. Someone said, God often moves the tape ten feet further just when we think we're finishing the last lap. Has He ever done that to you? And something happens in us when we've spent all that we have and we think we're at the end of our resources and then we look up and there's still another 30 yards to go. How are we going to do that? 
And we discover that when we are at the end of ourselves and we have no resources, when we have been put through this, God gives us the endurance to get up the next day and to put our feet on the floor and to start walking ahead and going forward. And we discover in the process of this that he gives us the strength for the day. How many of you know that? Isn't that true? And until you experience this, you can't know that. You are incomplete. Let, let me just tell you something. If you had any suffering, uh, you, you know, you're just not complete. God is, he's left something out of your training. He'll get to it sooner or later. But the completeness of walking through the fire with God and knowing that he is sufficient for every emotion and every experience and every deficiency you feel, that is the benefit of suffering. It causes you to have endurance in your life. And the next time it comes around, you know, hey, I've been down that road. And it doesn't seem like there's any answer right now, and, there, and, and it's really tough. But I want to tell you something. I remember when I was on this road before, God was enough. He was enough. So I'm going to keep going. I'll just touch on this, and you can put it in your notes. Suffering prunes us for greater effectiveness. <laughs> Did you know that? The Bible says in John 15, every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it might bear more fruit. One of the reasons God brings suffering into our life is to take away the things that are drawing off the energy of the Spirit that should be directed toward more productive things. And I'll, I'll just say this. Sometimes when you go through a time of suffering or, or discipline in your life from God, He makes you stop and look at all the things you're doing and ask yourself, am I doing the things God wants me to do or am I doing the things that I want to do? And sometimes he'll start lopping things off the edge because you see, one of the reasons why they prune a vineyard is because little shoots begin to grow on the vine that suck up the sap that causes fruit to happen. And so they go through the vineyard and they take their shears and they clip off these little shoots that grow out of the vine that don't have any fruit on them because what happens is they suck away the energy that's in the vine that should be directed to the fruitfulness of the vine. Does God ever do that in your life? He comes along with pressure and in the midst of that pressure you they say, wait a minute, I need to get that out of my life. That's, that's just eating up the energy that God wants to use for this. I don't think we'll ever, ever get finished with that process. You know, you just think you've got it figured out and it happens again. And, and you get rid of one thing and five more things grow back. Have you noticed that? The pruning process for more effectiveness.